So in the last video, we just talked through one of the common ways to rationalize the mixed logit model. And now we're going to look at another common way to do that, which is to generate flexible substitution patterns amongst our alternatives. And, and, and really the way to think about this is that we're trying to think about generating or, or creating kind of fully flexible correlations among random or unobserved utilities in our model. And so we're going to write down a random utility model that has these kind of fully flexible correlations. And so what we're going to say is that the utility that decision maker n obtains from alternative j is given by this formula here. It's a little different than what we're used to seeing. So we're going to say that there's some alpha vector of fixed coefficients alpha. So the, these are just kind of like the coefficients we had in, in the logit model, just fixed coefficients that are common across all across the whole population. We're going to have some of those fixed coefficients times some data. Plus, now we're going to have these mu, this vector mu, mu sub n, which is going to be a vector of random coefficients with mean zero. So these are all going to be coefficients that can vary throughout the population, but all centered at zero. And then finally, we're going to add on an, uh, an epsilon iid extreme value error term here. But what we've essentially done by writing down random utility this way is that now we have one component that's deterministic, this first term here. And now we have two components that are kind of random or stochastic that correspond to kind of unobserved utility. And it's going to be these second, uh, the second and third terms here. And so if we combine those two random components of utility into kind of a single composite random utility term, we can call that thing, we'll call that thing eta. So we're going to get eta sub nj, and it's just going to be the sum of these final two, uh, these final two terms in our random utility model that represent the randomness of the model. And so then we can write down uh, a slightly simpler format here, the utility that decision maker n obtains from, obtains from alternative j is going to be that alpha times x. So once again, you can think about this as being exactly like the logit model. Some fixed coefficients times data, linear, just like we had in the logit model. And then we're going to add this random or unobserved utility term. It's just that now this random utility term, eta, is more complex and more flexible than, than the simple IID extreme value assumption that we made back in the logit model. And in fact, what we get from having this more complex uh, random utility term is that we have kind of fully flexible uh, correlations among those random utility terms for our different alternatives. And in fact, the covariance between any two of these random utility terms, these eta terms. So two, the, core, the covariance between two of these eta terms uh, for different alternatives for the same individual is going to be given by, uh, it's, it's these, uh, sorry, I think there should not be a, uh, a, a, a prime or a transpose on, on one of these z's, uh, but it's going to be basically taking the, the z's, the data that go into this, uh, into this format. Uh, it's going to be a function of those z's and this big sigma matrix, which is going to be the variance covariance matrix of, of mu, the randomness. So essentially what we're allowing for here is that the covariance between any two alternatives for an individual is going to be a function of some either data or variables that we define and some variances and covariances that we estimate in our model. And this is going to give us a much more flexible format than, than either the logit model or the next the, the nested logit model. And so I think it can be useful to actually see what kind of how the logit and nested logit model fit into this kind of framework just so we can see kind of how restrictive those two models are and how really flexible this mixed logit model is. And so as I just said, this, this kind of representation uh, of covariances between our random utility term, this terms, these are going to, uh, this representation is going to generalize kind of all of the previous discrete choice models that we've discussed.
And so once again, we've got this covariance between two eta terms that's defined by Zs and, and this, that. so Zs are gonna be their data or, or kind of variables that we define and sigma is gonna be this variance covariance matrix that we estimate well, we can use this representation to get a logit model if we just assume that the z's are zero or empty, right? Then if the z's are zeros, then covariance just equals zero. And that's what we got from the logit model. So kind of the most restrictive thing here is we can just assume these z's are zero, the sigma doesn't matter, then when the covariance is just zero and we've got our logit model. We can use the same representation to get a nested logit model. And we can do that by thinking of our Zs as being a set of indicator variables for each nest. So we're gonna have K variables. If we have capital K nests, then we're gonna have capital K variables. And that variable is gonna equal one for each alternative in that nest and zero for the alternatives not in that nest. So we're gonna have you know, indicator variables defining our nests. Then we're gonna define mu sub k. So for each nest, we'll have a mu term. We're gonna ass ass uh, 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 assume that that thing is normally distributed, once again, with mean zero and with a variance of sigma k, and that it's IID across nests. So there's not gonna be any correlation across our nests. And then what we're gonna end up estimating here are gonna be the sigma k terms which are gonna give us the covariance between alternatives in nest K. And we can actually estimate that. So in order to go from this fully general form to a nested logit, you can see we actually made this really restrictive assumption about what our Zs are, what our mu's are. Uh, so, so we've gotten really restrictive. So you can imagine that as we start loosening what goes into Zs, what our mu's are, that we can start to represent any kind of correlations among random utility here. It can depend on not just indicator variables, but data. It could, it could depend on both. Disease could have some data and some indicator variables, um, all kinds of things. And we get to choose what goes in Z's. And so we get to essentially choose how we want our random utility terms to be correlated in the mixed logic model. So that's how we get so much flexibility here is, you know, even though, nested, even though the nested logit model kind of relaxed some of the rigidity of the logit model, kind of when you compare it to the mixed logit model, it was still a very restrictive form of, of correlations. So we've just kind of described the mixed logit model as coming from two different random utility models. And I think it's useful to just point out that these random utility models are, are mathematically equivalent. So if we wanted to start from that first kind of random coefficients expression for, for the random utility model, we can start here. We can recognize that we can decompose beta sub n into two terms, the mean and, and the variance basically, or the mean and deviations from that mean. So we'll call alpha the means and, and mu sub n the deviations. Let's also recognize that maybe we had some fixed parameters in beta and so if we have fixed parameters, then those are gonna have no mu. And so let's, let's kind of pull out the subset of our data that has random coefficients and we'll call that Z. So now X is all of our data. Z is just the, the random components uh, or the, com the, 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 sorry, X is all of our data. Z is the, the subset of data that has random coefficients and now we've got something that looks exactly like what we started with to get flexible substitution patterns here. So we can see that just kind of a simple, just kind of reconceiving of some of these variables or, or coefficients will get us between these two different random utility models. Um, of course, if all variables have random coefficients, so we can just set Z equal to X and, and things get maybe even a, a, you know, a little easier to see how these things become equivalent to one another. So even though they're equivalent, uh, and I guess I should say, because they're equivalent, that means, uh, uh, you know, no matter which, which way we think about this, we get the same choice probabilities that, that, that we talked about originally, and we can get these same kind of flexible substitution patterns, no matter which way we think about this model, because they're mathematically equivalent. However, I think depending on whether you think about this as being uh, individual specific random coefficients or flexible substitution patterns, 
that can kind of affect how you want to define your model. What data do you want to have random coefficients versus fixed coefficients? Do you want there to be correlations uh, or, or sorry, kind of covariances among the random coefficients that you have? Um, just kind of depending on what your, 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 your mindset and your framework is here, we'll, we'll define kind of how you want to, to set up your model. And, and the Ken Train talks through this in a little more detail in the book if you wanna kind of dive into the details of what I mean by this. What we're talking about flexible substitution patterns, so let me also kind of do what we've done previously, which is look at for the mixed logit model, what does a ratio of choice probabilities look like? Remember when we did this for the logit model, we ended up getting independence of irrelevant alternatives, IIA. When we did this for the nested logit model, we got kind of this sometimes IIA, sometimes IIN, independence of irrelevant nest properties. Well, if we use representative linear, uh, a linear representative utility here and, and, and take this ratio, we get this expression here. You might notice this is just the ratio of choice probabilities. There's kind of nothing that can cancel out because everything in these choice probabilities is inside an integral. And we can't just kind of like drop things out of the integral when, when the integral importantly depends on beta and these betas show up everywhere. So nothing Nothing cancels out like we got in the previous model. And so really what we can take away from this is that the ratio of any two choice probabilities not only depends on those, you know, the data about those two uh, alternatives, but here in the denominator of each integral, we have data about every alternative. So this ratio is going to depend on all of our alternatives. And so what we can say here is that the mixed logit model is not going to exhibit independence of irrelevant alternatives because all of the alternatives enter into this choice probability ratio. So no IIA, uh, you know, no IIN in general, everything, every choice probability, every a change in any choice probability is going to depend on all other alternatives. So uh, in a lot of ways, that's, that's good. That, that is a more kind of, uh, for a lot of settings, that's gonna be more representative of the true kinds of substitution patterns and the true kinds of uh, you know, relative preferences that people have. That the way they substitute between two goods is gonna depend on not just those two goods, but, but everything out there. And so we can actually go one step further and define elasticities here also. Uh, the elasticity formula or kind of expression for the nest, uh, for the mixed logit model gets pretty complicated, but we can talk through it here. So first I have own elasticity. So the own elasticity of alternative I with respect to its attribute Z sub NI, where a couple of slides ago, we defined Z to be this one vector. Now we're going to jump back to our, what we've talked about in the past, where Z is just any particular element of X. It's just some element of X. And what I have here is a little different than what's in the book, just because I think that the book's notation gets a little messy and this is more consistent with what we talked about for previous models. But anyway, the own elasticity of alternative I with respect to its own attribute Z is this formula here. So we've got to take that data Z divided by the choice probability for this individual and our alternative times this big integral here, where inside the integral is the coefficient on Z, the logit choice probability for this alternative for some particular beta, one minus that logit choice probability, and then we're going to multiply all of this by the density of beta and then integrate over that. So essentially you can think about this as like taking that weighted average, but instead of just taking that weighted average over the logit choice probability, we're taking that over beta times logit choice probability times one minus logit choice probability. So it's the, a similar kind of idea as we had for the, the, the mixed logit choice probabilities, we're just packing more stuff into that integral. 
And then in a similar way, the cross elasticity of alternative I with respect to attribute Z of alternative J. So once again, just to, to, to make this clear, we're talking about changing attribute Z of alternative J. And how does that affect the choice probabilities of alternative I? So this is gonna be, uh, it's gonna depend on the data of J, whatever that data is, Z sub NJ, divided by the choice probabilities for I. And then once again, times this integral here, where the integral is the coefficient on Z, the uh, logit for I, the logit for J, and then we're gonna multiply all that by the density of beta. So once again, this is kind of like a weighted average of beta times logit choice probability for alternative I times logit choice probability for alternative J, and then take the weighted average of that over the distribution of betas in the population. Uh, so once again, same ideas for the previous uh, elasticity and for the choice probabilities, we've just got more stuff packed into that integral. Um, and so just like with choice probabilities for the mixed logit model, these elasticities do not have closed form expressions. So we're going to have to do something more complex to, uh, to approximate these things. Uh, but I do just want to give a little intuition here. The basic idea is that these elasticities are going to depend on how the, the logit for I, the logit choice probability for I, or the uh, logit choice probabilities for I and J kind of vary or co-vary with one another as we integrate over our betas. And so that's gonna be determined by what you specify as random, kind of what distributions you put on those things, whether these different coefficients uh, co-vary with one another or not. So uh, how you set up the model is going to really importantly affect what kind of format these elasticities take. So that was a lot that got a little long, but we talked about kind of all of the flexible substitution patterns that we get out of the mixed logit model. The kind of third good property of the mixed logit model was that it worked well with panel data. And we're gonna talk about the mixed logit model with panel data in the next video.